be like in 2050. We think that the essence of the role will be much the same as today, enlightening ourselves and society as a whole about the past. However, we appreciate that at present, the profession is far from perfect. Whilst chartership offers opportunities for improvement, by 2050, these will need to have been seized upon. In this contribution, we highlight, through looking at a typical day for our 2050 archaeologist, current areas of concern, how we hope that these issues will have been addressed, and what, the, what role CEPA can play in creating this brighter future. Inevitably, this will be a somewhat idealised view of the future, and one that some of you will already have seen at the launch. But it represents our aspirations for the profession, a profession which those of us in the early stages of our career will both experience and create. There we go. So I spent my morning working on my latest project in which I'm helping a local community to realise their ambitions for the regeneration of their neighbourhood. Now, talking in terms of 2015, the current outputs and outcomes from the majority of, of archaeological projects that happen, a, a great literature report, an archive, perhaps something in an academic volume, you know, these aren't really enough to demonstrate real public value. What do these mean to the communities in which we're working? How many of them actually use these? Or are these outputs actually just used by other archaeologists in create other archaeologists in creating even more archaeology, you know, and archaeological research? And even projects that do go beyond this with open days and talks and maybe an interpretation board, you know, this, this isn't far enough either. By 2050, we must be better and more imaginative at the ways in which we demonstrate the public benefit and value of what we all do. Now, there are examples out there of excellent projects that are happening now, you know, that, that really do put public benefit at the heart of those projects and really do deliver and demonstrate the public value. And I'm sure everyone in this room can think of those examples. But we're going to touch now very briefly on, on a couple of examples, looking at it in, in two different contexts. So the first example I'm going to talk about is um, the work of the York Archaeological Trust at Hungate. Now this was the biggest ever archaeological excavation within the city centre in York. And it put public participation and, and education and public access right at the very heart in ev of everything that project did. They offered the local communities opportunities to work alongside professionals to explore their heritage, to learn new skills, to build their confidence and to play a direct and active role in the archaeological process. They had a dedicated community archaeology group. They engaged with a young offenders program. They had uh, a whole host of activities for schools going out into the classroom or, or bringing them onto site. They also offered field work training through a field school program um, over, over summers for universities, but also longer term placements for, for students, you know, where they were, they were learning <coughs> field work skills over a whole year. They also had the more standard outputs, the sort of open days, the site tours, and, and the public talks, but they had site tours every day being offered through the dig, their, their archaeological attraction up the road, and they had, had six wider public open days every year of the project. And this was all part of a, a, a redevelopment project, you know, and it was a partnership between the Archaeological Trust, the City Council, and the redeveloper, and all this was realised through means of a Section 106 agreement that, that you know, said that they had to put this public access and education and, and participation at the very heart of their project, which is what they did. Another example I'm going to touch on is the work of um, Surrey County Archaeology Unit. Um, they work with Combat Stress, a mental health charity for veterans, and through archaeological activities such as talks and artifact handling, finds processing, um, taking part in training sessions and working towards formal qualifications and taking part in community archaeology. These activities form part of a varied activity-based rehabilitation program which help the veterans to learn new skills, to pursue new, new interests and to integrate back into civilian society. And I'd like to thank Hannah Potter, who's here today, who's a new generation member and is the community archaeologist at the Surrey County Archaeology Unit for that case study. And if anyone wants to pursue that a bit further, She's just there, so please, please talk to Hannah and ask her any questions. So these projects and others like them, and many others like them, they need to be our inspiration and our springboard to achieve real public value and, and demonstrate public benefit across all the different areas that archaeologists work in. By 2050, we need to go beyond merely engaging with the communities in which we are working, but to work with those communities in the co-creation of projects we need to develop pathways to impact for each project 
that's tailored to the priorities and needs of each community that empowers them to take an active role in the archaeological process. And we need for community archaeology to be exactly that, project, projects that are initiated by the communities rather than simply a useful add-on that opens the doors for additional sources of funding for projects that are going to happen anyway. And to realise all this, we need to change the way that we work. We need the contractors at all sorts of levels and all sorts of scale that aren't already doing so to widen the scope of their work and to open their eyes to the wider benefits that their work can bring, not just <coughs> ticking the boxes through the brief and through the WSI and getting the job done. We need those, those companies that are already doing this to, to not get complacent and to keep pushing the boundaries and exploring new opportunities to place public benefit at the heart of their projects. We need the curatorial archaeologists to widen their vision of what can be achieved and to work with contractors and consultants to develop, or develop meaningful enhancement works and meaningful dissemination from their projects. And we need academic researchers to ensure that they are answering research questions that are of public relevance and in the public interest and that public benefit isn't only included as a bit of lip service in their funding bit to get the money. And scale inevitably is important here you know, a one-day watching brief isn't going to be able to deliver the same scale of public benefit as, you know, a large-scale investigation project. But even if, at this smaller scale, there must be more that we can do. The case study from Surrey shows that actually delivering public benefit doesn't have to be linked to a particular investigation project, but can be part of the wider remit of what we all do all the time. Now, the Chartered Institute has an important role to play here as the body representing heritage professionals. It must, it must continue to work with other sector bodies, with CBA, Argeo, FAE, and the National Heritage Agencies, to, help, to work towards breaking down the barriers to participation in archaeology, to diversify the ways that archaeological knowledge is created, and to raise, and importantly, <coughs> deliver on the expectations of the public benefit that archaeology can bring. So, our 2050 project involves, amongst others, the local authority, architects, ecologists, engineers, youth workers, artists and community business leaders working alongside ourselves and local residents to develop a scheme that delivers a better place to live and work and that embodies the area's industrial heritage which provides its unique sense of place. That's too far. No, that's all right. Um, despite the best intentions of current planning policy and regulation, at present it's only in exceptional cases where the conservation and enhancement of heritage assets is fully integrated into development. We feel that these, this needs to change by 2050 and hope that it will have done. At present, local planning authorities and developers are too close-minded when it comes to understanding the value that heritage can bring to a development. Public benefit is seen in terms of economic growth and job creation which of course are very important, but they might be pursued to the detriment of heritage, which can itself bring further social, including economic benefits, if intelligently incorporated into a project. Too often, heritage statements focus on why development isn't bad for heritage, whilst failing to engage more deeply with the question of what makes a place significant and how development might actually benefit a heritage asset. Heritage consultants are of course generally working to the brief provided by their client, which in turn is governed by planning authorities' requirements and national and local planning policy. The terms of reference, which heritage professionals work in, therefore, need to change. We need to be asked to think laterally, and clients to think of heritage not as a contaminant which needs to be dealt with, but rather as an essential ingredient of a sustainable and enhancing development. A good example of somewhere where a more enlightened approach has been taken with real public heritage benefits is Princess Hay in Exeter. Here, an initial plan limited in scope compared to the subsequent scheme was withdrawn and replaced with a scheme which was intended to enhance and better reveal the significance of the various heritage assets in the vicinity, which include Exeter Cathedral and Close and the city wall. The developer and archaeological contractor worked closely together to produce what English Heritage called an intelligent programme of work. <coughs> Although the results are still being written up, the site has clearly enhanced our understanding of Exeter's archaeology. The archaeological work was supported in the decision notice from the council by provision for public viewing of archaeological works, the taking of measures to protect buried archaeology from piling, and a section 106 agreement secured funding for the conservation, display, and archiving of archaeological materials to a sum of £70,000. The end result was a modern development which better revealed the significance of the city wall and open up views to Exeter Cathedral. 
English Heritage stated that both architects and developers at Princess Hay showed um, they understood the value of the heritage site, whilst Exeter City Council emphasised the collaboration which took place between themselves, the architects, English Heritage and the developer. So although this was a commercial scheme, this project shows how even within a pre-MPPF world, development could take place which was at a minimum sympathetic to, and in reality allowed the heritage values of the site to be better realised, whilst also providing a commercially viable development as a result of close cooperation between heritage professionals and other parties. So opportunities for real um, public and heritage benefits are being missed when heritage professionals are not entered into collaborative relationships with architects, engineers, planners and other professionals. In the case of large developments such as Princess Hay, the attitude of the local authority in promoting these collaborations and the importance of heritage to their vision of the place is clearly significant. Whilst Princess Hay demonstrates that commercially viable schemes um, what Princess Hay demonstrates is that commercially viable schemes which enhance the significance of heritage assets can be achieved. By 2050, such collaboration will happen as a matter of course. Indeed, architects and planners will question why the heritage consultant is not at the table in the exceptional case where they aren't, rather than expressing surprise at the novelty value of early engagement with heritage issues. CIFA, of course, have a key role to play in creating such a working environment. Chartership provides opportunities to promote the heritage profession to other chartered bodies, demonstrating the value of what we do and why we should be integral to development. Chartership brings reputational benefits, and it's vital that these are seized by promoting the concept of a highly skilled heritage professional who is able to work for the benefit of the public, not as a fringe sector who delay progress in clear sites of problematic archaeology or introduce the need for expensive mitigation. In the afternoon, I attended a meeting about a particularly tricky section of High Speed 5. <coughs> the current proposed route impacts upon several designated and undesignated cultural and natural heritage assets, and these impacts need to be managed, but they also present many exciting opportunities for conservation and enhancement. Now, in 2015, the definition of what we mean by heritage, although broadening all the time, is still very much fixed within a sort of cultural arena and natural and sort of geo-heritage occupy separate, although inevitably somewhat overlapping, spheres. And our heritage is valued in relation to the contribution that it makes to society, be that its value to the economy, uh, its educational research value, or its cultural or societal value. And significance is the driving factor for the level of protection that it's offered. However, not all our heritage is valued equally. Conservation of our natural heritage seems to be, in a lot of cases, the primary consideration, leaving cultural heritage and geo-heritage behind and in second place. We seem to be left with, with a three-tier system, with sort of the, the ecological, the natural heritage on top, maybe the historic environment and cultural heritage comes second, and, and geo-heritage down at the bottom, sometimes neglected. So should the, historic envi should the, the natural environment take precedence in this way forever, Aren't our geodiversity and our historic environment, our cultural heritage, not equally important? Because really, they're, they're all part of the same thing. It's all part of an integrated whole. In 2050, our heritage is full and integrated. The links between asset types have been fully explored and the barriers between them have been broken down. And as a result, our heritage is made up of everything that a generation inherits. This includes the natural heritage assets, the ecosystems, the habitats and the species, what today we think of as cultural heritage assets, the archaeological sites, the historic remains, the landscapes, the places, the, the artefacts and the collections. Our intangible heritage, our languages, our dialects, our, our cultural knowledge, our customs and festivals. And our geo-heritage, you know, our, our caves, our mineral deposits, our, our fossil sites, our big glacial valleys and ribbon lakes. The vast array of designations that used to exist have now been replaced by a single integrated system that provides a suitable level of protection according to the significance of each asset. And it's a system that's able to adapt and remain meaningful to society as what society values or deems significance changes. As a result, our heritage is more widely understood and valued, not only because of its economic or its social or cultural benefits, although these important values are fully appreciated and acknowledged by society, but they are recognised for their intrinsic value and are worthy of protection and conservation regardless of their economic value to society. This is not to suggest that in 2050 we believe that everything should be conserved. This is no more acceptable in 2050 than in 2015, but we have more effective strategies and mechanisms to determine what is conserved 
and what is not. And although not preventing change, we are more canny and effective in managing and shaping that change to our own ends to ensure the conservation and enhancement of heritage. The Chartered Institute has an important role to play in promoting and highlighting examples of best practice in its advocacy role in representing the historic environment and working with other professionals and professional institutes across the disciplines to forge and shape a stronger future together. And without a doubt, the enhanced status that Chartership brings will help here. It will help us as historic environment professionals to be part of that process, to be part of that debate, to have a seat around that table rather than being relegated to a secondary consideration. I end my day by making a few phone calls, or the 2050 equivalent thereof, um, to ensure that all the final arrangements are in place by our heritage section's CIFA inspection tomorrow. The issue of standards and ethics is one of the biggest concerns raised by the profession at present, and should continue to be. However, current concerns revolve as much around whether current standards and mechanisms for their enforcement are fit for purpose, as much as whether they're being effective. This debate is exemplified by work currently being undertaken in relation to the adherence to standards in the analysis of pottery from archaeological sites. At the TAG conference in 2012, Paul Blinkhorn gave a paper which generated much debate during and after the conference. His argument, supported by the data which is up on the screen, is that the use of pottery type series and the study of medieval ceramics was in decline. This is not only in breach of established CEPA standards and guidance, but is also detrimental to our understanding of medieval archaeology. Blinkhorn is highly critical of the CEPA standards, rightly pointing out that they don't explicitly define what a suitably experienced specialist is, nor do they require adherence to more spe detailed specialist guidance produced by period-based pottery research groups. And Blinkhorn's study does highlight some real issues with the interpretation and use of existing standards and guidance, but I think it also hits on two more critical points. The first of these relates to professional ethics. <laughs> Whilst the guidance does not explicitly define a suitably experienced specialist, professional ethics would determine that somebody can only take on work if they feel they are suitably qualified, having received relevant training. This cuts, in my mind, to the heart of professionalism. Professionalism is about ensuring work is undertaken to a high standard in an ethical manner. Perhaps what is equally lacking, except for the few able or willing to commit time to the MBQ in archaeological practice, alongside the much lamented lack of training in pottery analysis, is a lack of explicit training in professionalism, professional ethics, and working to the spirit of professional standards. A further point raised by Blinkhorn is the disjuncture between what is required and what is approved in a final report. Briefs in the county surveyed explicitly or implicitly through requiring adherence to CEPA standards required the use of the county ceramic type series. However, as the, as the survey shows, this requirement was not always being met. And CEPA are criticised for failing to take disciplinary action. But a more important point is that curators are the point at which standards should, will be routinely enforced. And as an anonymous quote from a curator in Blinkhorn's paper states, enforcing every standard within the modern economic climate is not always practically possible. Curators would appear to not be empowered to enforce standards as they feel they lack support from local authorities and perhaps from the archaeological community more generally. Such empowerment, we believe, um, can occur in the future and should be firmly ingrained by 2050. It can only be achieved, however, by archaeologists explicitly demonstrating the public benefit of their work, in doing so, clients will understand the work of their archaeological contractors and demand more of it, whilst curators will be in a stronger position to enforce standards. However, if the profession were to develop a stronger sense of professional ethics, enforcement of standards amongst professionals should ideally become a non-issue. There will not be an explicit requirement for professionals to be C for members because it will become expected by clients, and the valuing of professionalism and ethics amongst archaeologists will lead to individuals and organisations signing up not out of necessity, but ethical and professional desire. So CIFA must facilitate training in standards and ethics and continue to monitor these whilst not shying away from enforcement action where necessary. Chartership highlights the importance of professionalism and should therefore provide fresh impetus for addressing these issues. New standards must also develop and existing ones be refreshed to keep pace with exciting innovations in heritage practice and to address ambiguities in existing standards and guidance, such as those highlighted by Blinkhorn. So I work in a vibrant environmental consultancy within the heritage section of an integrated conservation and design team. 
I have a diverse range of colleagues, both in terms of their background and their career entry route. And we particularly pride ourselves on our apprenticeship scheme, which is fully supported by CEPA and other professional institutes. <coughs> so we're going to take a look at a typical archaeologist in 2050. And here he is. He is white, um, taking stats from Landward's research on the latest profiling profession. Going to through there. Yeah. Ninety-nine percent of all archaeologists working in the UK are, are white. He is able-bodied. Only two percent have have some form of disability. He is middle class. Okay, this data hasn't been collected, but just do anecdotal evidence from working in the profession. We are largely a middle class profession. Um, he's degree educated. 93% of archaeologists in the UK have an undergraduate degree or higher. And when you look at the new generation, oh, there we go, this is more forward, he's got a degree. Uh, if you look at the new generation, those under 30, that rises to 95%. So we're very highly trained in terms of the academic route into the profession. Um, and if he's over 40, then he's probably male. At the moment, there's more, more, more men are in the profession over 40. If he's under 40, then he's probably female. At the moment, that's the way to start. So, I'll just go back. Yeah, again. I can't go back. It's okay, broken. never mind. So, basically, it's presenting an image of the profession which really isn't very diverse at all. And we need to make the profession a more diverse place. We need to address the barriers that are pre preventing a more diverse section of society from entering our profession in order to achieve that diversity. And greater diversity will allow us to reach more diverse audiences and to successfully demonstrate the relevance and value of what we do in areas and communities which we haven't been able to reach very successfully before. So we're jumping forward to profiling the profession 2049, 2050. Um, and here we have our archaeologists. Let's have a look what, what profiling the profession 2050 tells us. Well, it tells us that we have a profession that's more reflective of national trends on the diversity of the UK. So we have archaeologists drawn from all the social backgrounds and all the ethnic groups that are <coughs> represented in the UK. And as the nature of archaeological work changes, disability is not the barrier that it once was. This is an absolute necessity, not only to allow equal rights of access for people that want to come into the profession, but with the new retirement age at 75 and only going upwards to accommodate the needs of those senior professionals, you know, that, 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 that might need some more support in retaining their expertise. So maybe we need to add a couple more figures in there. And again, there we go. So, you know, these, these are our archaeologists of the future. <coughs> so we have a, a highly skilled and qualified workforce. Entry to the profession can come by an academic route, but also via a vocational route and through apprenticeships. And with the vocational route being so well developed as it is in 2050, the prevalence of that academic route in is start to decline. So I've got the figures up there that, you know, maybe 60% of archaeologists are coming through a vocational route, maybe only 40% academic route. I don't know about those figures, you know, I had to make them up, but we might, might be somewhere in that area at that point. Both pathways into the profession offer a highly trained and valued and skilled individual not only skilled in technical archaeological um, skills, but also a whole host of transferable skills, <laughs> leadership, business and finance management, project and people management, health and safety, public engagement, communication. When the new generation group a few years ago did our training survey, it's these sorts of transferable skills that the new generation members were telling us that they were lacking. They weren't getting trained in that at work. They didn't get trained at university and their skills that they needed for their career. The difference between the two entry routes will result in them appealing to different types of students, and this in itself will introduce more diversity into the profession. And once you're within the profession, there's a well-developed career structure in which to work and a progression pathway, both within individual organisations and across the sector as a whole. Formal training is present and active within all archaeological organisations. No matter how small, even the smallest unit is you know, given the time and resources to properly train and develop their staff. And formal training in CPD responds not only to the needs that the individual identifies, but the needs of that organisation and the needs of the sector of the whole. And the impact of all training and CPD is assessed at each of these three levels. And the CPD in training happen by me happens by means of formal training courses that anyone can partake in by use of a virtual learning environment. And there's an industry-wide mentoring scheme that people can take part in. 
as currently being developed in a proposal by the new generation that we want to pilot a mentoring scheme for the industry. But there's also a formal programme of succession planning. So when senior practitioners do retire, we can transfer their knowledge and pass their knowledge on to more junior, junior colleagues. That's not being lost. And interesting, based on current stats, as it's going in the last version of the profiling profession, it suggests that by 2050, archaeology will be a predominantly female profession if, if we do carry on on that, that, that trajectory. This dual system of career entry training and formal training and development for professionals will provide an effective way of addressing skills gaps and skills shortages within the profession. Once you've identified that shortage or that skills gap, you can adapt the training and the courses so we can fill those gaps and meet the needs of the profession, which will also help us to consistently raise standards. And with a more diverse profession working to ever higher standards and a well-developed route for progression into the career, more people will be aware of the possibilities and prospects that career and heritage and archaeology can bring. So we don't end up with situations like this, which is certainly what I experienced, um, and I'm sure it's what other people experience too. So the Chartered Institute is, and it needs to continue to be at the heart of the network that helps to provide training, mentoring, CPD, through industry standard uh, CPD <coughs> monitoring forms, through you know, running accredited training courses. But it's also at a position, in a position to look at the wider needs of the entire sector and to encourage its members or its registered organisations to adapt their training and their CPD to meet those needs and fill those gaps. It needs to continue to take the lead in exploring and, and promoting the alternative routes into the profession and to promote the profession itself as a worthwhile career option to a wider audience. Oh. At the end of the day, I meet up with my friends and colleagues in the Cybertronic Alcohol Dome, or pub. <laughs> Thank God I've got a self-driving car. Some things will never change. Thank you.